Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial, and today we're going to be talking about something that's near and dear to many of your hearts, or should I say livers, that is the history of alcohol in the Navy. So we are at the Pine Tavern Distillery. Uh, Pine Tavern is a huge supporter of the museum, and they make Battleship New Jersey rum. So if that's something that interests you, stay tuned until the end of the video. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but also check the links in the description below for more information about this product and this company that supports the battleship. The U.S. Navy got many of its early traditions from the Royal Navy. It makes sense. We're a British colony. Many of our earliest captains had sailed on either British warships or merchant vessels. Uh, and so a lot of the, the traditions, the training methods, and even the supplies that U.S. Navy ships carried were very similar to what you would expect to find on a British ship. And that makes sense, because the Royal Navy was the predominant uh, force of the 18th and 19th century, and, and even into the 20th century. So emulating them uh, makes perfect sense. The Royal Navy has long had a tradition of serving grog which with the Royal Navy is rum mixed with water. And so when the U.S. Navy was formed, the U.S. Navy also issued grog to its sailors. Uh, this has a morale purpose, and um, it's also a little bit of liquid that hasn't been sitting in big wooden or metal tanks in the hull of your ship for six months, getting funky and growing stuff. So, um, for about the first decade of the U.S. Navy, we served rum just like the British Navy. Now, the British Navy served rum because a lot of their uh, Caribbean colonies that produced sugar made rum. So it was cheap for them and it supported their own economy to supply that. Now, the United States uh, at this time did not make much rum. So, uh, in about 1806, the U.S. Navy decided, you know, making grog from rum makes no sense for us. Let's switch over to whiskey. So the United States doesn't have many sugarcane plantations, but does have a lot of corn. Uh, so whiskey made huge sense. Now we're supporting fledgling American industries. Uh, during this same time period, you see a lot of tariffs imposed on things being traded into the country. Uh, and a lot of early isolationism, which was attempting to jumpstart American industry and uh, did some damage to the American economy at the time. It also um, contributed to some of the early wars that the U.S. Navy fought in and was distinguished during. So, uh, for the U.S. Navy, grog originally was a half a pint of whiskey mixed with a half a pint of water. The reason you're mixing water into the whiskey is not so much uh, because you're trying to water it down, and this would be high proof stuff that needs to be watered down, but once you've mixed it together, uh, it's, it's going to become less and less potent over time, so a sailor can't save up several days worth of grog and then drink it all at once and get drunk and can't work. You've basically got to drink it right then and there uh, when your grog ration is issued. The temperance movement is going to play a large part in this story, and uh, we first see it with the early Navy, where if you choose not to accept a grog ration, uh, you can accept an extra six cents of pay per day. Uh, at different times in the U.S. Navy's history, the, the price was a little bit less, but six cents seems to be the most and what was most common. In 1842, with the temperance movement picking up steam, the grog ration was cut in half so that you only got a quarter pint of whiskey or a gill. And while we're talking about this, every sailor had a cup that they received their grog ration in. You would wash the outside of that cup, but never the inside. So you can save as much of that flavor over time as possible. The modern Navy still does that with coffee cups. In 1862, once the Civil War had started, the temperance movement was finally able to ban the grog ration. 
So while this passes earlier in the year, it's September 1st, 1862, when the grog ration is formally abolished and enlisted sailors are not issued alcohol anymore. How was this able to come to pass? Well, when the South seceded, many of the interests that the country had in corn farming also seceded with them. So then there was no longer enough of a voting block in Congress to stop the abolitionists from abolishing alcohol. Just because the Navy was no longer issuing grog didn't mean that sailors couldn't bring their own alcohol on board. And it's worth noting that officers were never allowed to have grog, i.e. the Navy issuing them stuff. The Navy doesn't issue the officers food. They are gentlemen and they deserve something better. They're paid significantly more and therefore they buy their own food and alcohol. Uh, and functionally, this looks like uh, just an allowance is taken out of their uh, paychecks nowadays for the officer's mess food. Uh, but during the age of sale, it, it was much more common for uh, officers to buy their own stuff. And, and so they would have their own stores of alcohol for fancy events and entertaining guests and just for their own general use. In 1899, with the U.S. Navy rapidly increasing in size, the practice of enlisted sailors being able to bring their own alcohol on board ships is entirely removed. Uh, in fact, enlisted sailors at that point aren't even allowed to buy alcohol on base or within a certain distance of base. However, it's not until 1914 that Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels, a notorious teetotaler, bans all alcohol from ships in their entirety. So at that point, all that was left was the officer's mess. And I should mention that ships still carried alcohol for medicinal purposes. Uh, so there was still some on the ship, but that had to be approved for use by the medical officer or the captain. Uh, so in 1914, when this goes into effect, the bulk of the U.S. Navy is off the coast of Veracruz uh, following the uh, U.S. occupation of that city in Mexico. Uh, and there are also international ships nearby, too, with World War I not quite started yet. Uh, and so all these officers have all this booze on board, and they've got to figure out what to do with it. So there are some extremely notorious parties that occurred off Veracruz in 1914. Uh, and the, the crews of these U.S. Navy ships were not in sufficient quantity to dispose of all this alcohol, so they had to invite sailors from the other ships on board to help them out. Now, it should be noted that even though alcohol in the U.S. Navy is removed in 1914, just short of prohibition, that is not the case with other navies. The Royal Navy doesn't abolish it until 1970, and the last uh, former British colony doesn't get rid of it until 1990. That's the New Zealand Navy. So, uh, and, and some countries still have alcohol on ships. I've been on a uh, German frigate where the chief's mess has a beer tap. Starting during the Carter administration, the U.S. Navy was allowed to carry beer on ships again so that if a ship is deployed for more than 45 days, each sailor gets two cans of beer. I've also heard tell that on occasion storekeepers would drop an individual can of beer into the soda machines on ships so that one lucky sailor might get a beer um, and that might help crew morale. It might help sell more sodas and all that money then goes into the crew morale fund. Uh, my, my name is Bill Cox. I am one of the owners and the head distiller here at Pine Tavern Distillery. First farm-based distillery and the first distillery in Salem County since Prohibition. Um, we started in 2015. Uh, we became licensed in 2016. Uh, we started doing the Battleship Rum about six months ago. Um, the Battleship Rum is a unique product that we do here. It's a rum that we produce from Blackstrap Molasses. Um, we also, after the distilling process, add a local clover honey. Uh, the Battleship New Jersey honey flavored rum is distributed through Kramer Beverage. Uh, as of right now, it's distributed to about 100 stores uh, in South Jersey. Um, if your store does not have the Battleship Rum, make sure you ask them for it uh, and you can come out and try a free sample. But I mean, the Battleship New Jersey is, uh, it's a very unique product and it's a cool product that we got involved with because of the 
the aspect of donating back to the battleship to help maintain the museum. Um, it was kind of hit hard by COVID and we re were reached out to by the battleship to see if we'd be interested in doing a rum for them. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic spirit and it mixes well in most cocktails. You should try it with apple cider. It's, we call it the apple crush. It's probably one of the more, more popular cocktails here at the distillery. New Jersey honey rum is made, uh, we take blackstrap molasses, water, and yeast. Uh, we let it ferment for about a week, week and a half. Um, we put it into our 110 gallon still here. After the 110 gallon still is run, that's called our low wines. That's the initial stripping run of the, of the spirit. We then take it and put it into our finishing still, our 26 gallon finishing still. Um, we get about 20% of the total yield uh, in a finished product. And after it's completely distilled, we blend it with water, we cut it down, and then we add a local honey to sweeten it. Uh, and we decided to do honey because of the Seabees, the Navy's engineering battalion. So their, their logo is the honey bee. So it kind of made sense. Um, and honey rum is a very unique product. There's not a lot of honey rums out there. Um, the honey rum isn't a big product that's made in the US. It actually started in the Canary Islands. Um, so it's a very, very niche rum, but it's a fantastic spirit. The rum kind of highlights the honey and the honey kind of translates well in the rum itself. Um, it mixes well in most cocktails and it's a fantastic spirit. So if you, the way we distill it here, it's a little bit different than if you were a sailor stuck on the battleship. Um, we use a distilling process, whereas some sailors can get creative by fermenting their own blackstrap molasses on a sailing vessel and they would have other means to get the alcohol out of it. Um, this is a much more refined product than what the sailors made, but this still has a, a sailor mentality when we distill it. It's a bold tasting rum. It should also be noted that uh, while we're specifically talking about alcohol on ships, there are other occasions when uh, the military has given out alcohol in the recent past. For example, World War II, if uh, you got leave on Mugbug, during the Pacific War, you got issued two cans of rather warm beer. Uh, and I imagine that while Magmag is famous, that uh, there were probably instances of this all over the place. Sailors are, of course, notorious for drinking during Liberty. And this, of course, presumes that things are done the legal way. There's plenty of evidence that uh, sailors snuck alcohol on board ships, uh, sailors and officers. There's plenty of evidence that uh, Sailors set up their own illegal stills in engineering spaces and elsewhere on ships. Uh, heck, Battleship New Jersey has a wine cellar on board where her last captain converted one of his pantries into a wine cellar. And we still have the shelves with the names of the various brands of wine taped onto them. And the, the age of steam powered vessels definitely helps with sailors having their own stills on board. It's very easy to tap off of that and use it for your own purposes. Um, maybe your ship isn't steam powered like most submarines. Well, then you take the alcohol that's used to fuel some of the torpedoes and you mix it with fruit juice to make jungle juice and boom, you've got alcohol that way. Don't do that at home, it makes you very, very sick. And of course, we can't talk about alcohol on ships without offering you the chance to have a drink on a US Navy warship. Battleship New Jersey is the largest bar in the state of New Jersey. The state of New Jersey, uh, when you get a liquor license, it applies to your whole property. And our property happens to be uh, basically a 90-story office building laying on our side in the water. Uh, so the battleship can and does sell alco alcohol, and uh, can and does have beer fests and other events with alcohol on board. So be sure to reach out if you'd like to schedule something like that, or stay in touch so that you can see when we're hosting events like that. And on days when the chow line is open, you can buy a beer right on board with your lunch. What's your favorite kind of alcohol? And do you think the US Navy should still have a grog ration or some modern equivalent? Let us know in the comments section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, as well as from a number of other businesses and private individuals. One business in particular that supports the museum is the Pine Tavern Distillery where we're filming today. And like I said at the beginning of the video, they produce a Battleship New Jersey rum, which has uh, a honey flavor. And uh, while the museum does not sell it, you can buy it from many local distributors. And uh, 
They can potentially ship it to you depending on what state you live in. We've got some links in the description there. Um, so if, if you're interested in supporting the battleship, Pine Tavern, um, and getting hammered while you do it, be sure to check those links out in the description and uh, try some of our battleship rum. You can also support the museum by donating in the link in the description below and by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about our ship and our glorious alcoholic past. Thanks for watching.